Welcome to the show that's back from the dead. Anglican Unscripted, episode 495. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and it's the 18th of March, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 2019, second week of Lent. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Okay, we I need to be honest with the audience. This is probably the second or third taping of 495, and uh, we have discovered we are in need of your prayers and intentions and uh, uh, intercessions. This uh, ministry has obviously gotten the ire of the enemy uh, and is now, you know, putting us as hosts in places uh, that we didn't think possible. And uh, we've gone through a lot of stuff this last couple months and uh, we would intentionally ask for your prayers and thank you for them. Uh, also, please share this program and comment in the comments on the uh, YouTube channel. Share it with your friends. Subscribe if you've not subscribed yet. We also have a podcast. You can find those in the show notes. Guys, I would ask how you're doing, but I know how you're doing, and we don't need to tell people how we're doing, but how's it going? Well, I'd just like to say share it if this ever gets out. <laughs> yes, right. If this episode ever gets out. <laughs> Please share it. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we recorded Friday, and I, uh, or was it Thursday? What, what day did we record? Both, both. both yeah, Thursday, Friday, and uh, just that that file just disappears. Just well, goes. we did we did Monday, and I wrecked that by getting all choked up and over emotional. So we had to can that. Yeah, and then we did a really good show on Friday, and you yeah. lost it. I lost, As it, it. lost the file. <laughs> God, I, in the history, I never lost a file, and it, it just disappears from the hard drive. I ran uh, programs. I bought a program online, find uh, corrupted files, nothing. Just It was gone, gone, not just kind of gone. <sighs> so we're going to move on to the news. A lot has happened in the time since we've recorded an actual show, uh, specifically there was a murderous attack in New Zealand that we'll certainly talk about. There's been comments in response to that from officials in the Church of England that is just bewildering to me. There's comments and stuff going on uh, around the world mm -hmm. in kind of the one-sidedness of understanding um, what people think is terrorism, what people think is um, just a madman, what people think is uh, a new crusade going on. Yeah, right. And so we need to kind of digest this and talk about this as a, the group of three here. And I would start with Gavin because your Church of England folk, uh, two archbishops I can think of off the top of my head, don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yes, well, I wonder if we shouldn't start with George and his Sunday sermon because that sounded very good to sure. me. But perhaps <laughs> if, if, if George can bring it in at, at the end as a... If or, or, or interrupt me with it. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is the relationship between culture and, and the truth of Christianity. Uh, Jesus did say the truth will set you free. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, at the risk of being pedantic, one of the things we're trying to do here is to get as close to the, the truth of authentic Christianity as, as we can. Not, not that we're better than anybody else or cleverer, but, but we're struggling t together collectively to find it. And the reason this matters is, is that over the history of the church, there have been periods when the church has slipped into one kind of error or another. And, and the moment it does that, it pays quite a serious spiritual price. So it's not about being right or being cerebral. It's about keeping it the center of the eye of the Holy Spirit, I think. And, if, and George. I, I, <clears throat> I, I, last, last two shows, and we, we discussed this, and I... And I think we can now discuss it more in a more streamlined version. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have in my, I've spoken often of my parish, which I love tremendously. It's a wonderful place, but we are rife with heresy. Now, what do I mean? We're, we're not kooky, you know, Southern California heretics. You're no name but, it and claim it stuff. Yes. No, or no prosperity gospel, but, you know, I did some series on Christian doctrines, and I find most people don't believe in original sin. Mm. They believe in the perfectibility of human beings, that deep down in their heart, 
man is the measure of all things, that men can be perfected, that if you only, from the movie South Pacific, we have the song uh, sung, sung um, where you have to be carefully taught to hate. And one of the things I pointed out in my sermons was that you don't have to be taught to hate. That's natural. What you have to be taught is to love. And Gavin identified this as Pelagianism. And we see it in conservative, ordinary, working-class people in the United States, in my little parish. And we see it in the Archbishop of Canterbury in York. A Pelagianism, a denial that God is the measure. God is in charge. Um, it, Gavin, am I... Yes, I, no, that, it's, it's a good, a good. We have saved people half an hour of listening. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a long, a long That's time. That's the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason, and this matters. How does this express itself? The, the problem with Pelagianism is, if you don't understand about original sin, you can't be saved, because it puts you in a position of of self improvement. And one of the reasons why we do talk about the pronouncements of the leaders of the church is because they set the theological climate and the certain theological expectations. So, so when, for example, Archbishop Welby and Sentamu say to make two very serious public pronouncements as they've made them this week, we're not heresy hunting when we say that what they said fell far short of the truth of what Jesus taught. So, so the two things that were said were uh, Archbishop Welby began to lament about how difficult evangelism was in a lecture he gave because he said how can a, a white person from with a colonial heritage speak to anybody else outside that without checking their privilege uh, and therefore one has to be very very careful uh, i found myself that very week speaking to a sikh who sold me a mount for my iphone on the on my car to save myself breaking the law and and as we talked because I was wearing a dog collar, he said, uh, isn't it a shame that people don't listen to what you teach them, Father, because our churches are empty of young people. So we, we talked about that, and I told him how important I thought Jesus was, and he listened respectfully and told me a bit about Sikhism. We, we did a certain amount. But, but if I had felt myself restrained by the colonial guilt that Archbishop Welby has, has scooped up from cultural Marxism, which disempowers me from speaking in a very clear way uh, to him, then, then such evangelism as we had entered into would have been seriously impaired. And it, it's, it's a, it's a, evangelism is really quite hard. We all know that. But to make it worse by, lab, by lab, labouring people with guilt. After all, it, it's not, George, as if Sir Patrick wasn't an Englishman. <laughs> the, the, uh, the topic of my sermon, St. Patrick's Day, was not about let's all go down to the pub and have green beer and corned beef and cabbage, uh, but rather trying to rescue Patrick from the crass commercialism of our modern era and to point out exactly this fact, that Patrick was an Englishman who was enslaved by the Irish, yet he escaped as a slave. And was and returned as a priest and missionary to the exact people who hated him. Now, seventeen hundred years ago, an Englishman teaching a new religion in Southern Ireland would be as welcome as it would be today. <laughs> of, of Gavin uh, uh, driving to uh, Can uh, Connemara and uh, preaching Protestantism, it would not be well received. And for Justin Welby, that would be a horrendous thing for Patrick to presume as an Englishman to teach the Irish about the good news of Jesus Christ. In, in our American culture, we now have uh, these horrific politi politicians uh, who are defining people by race, by uh, sexual orientation, uh, that you know, Stacey Abrams, the unsuccessful candidate for Georgia, gave a an article in Foreign Affairs where it's essentially saying that uh, white and Asian, East Asian men, you know, Chinese and Japanese and European descent Americans must be held back to allow everybody else to move forward and that we must identify with tribe. And Christ taught clearly, as Paul wrote, there's no slave nor free, male nor female, Greek nor Jew in Jesus Christ. And yet we now have the Archbishop of Canterbury saying that before we listen to Christ's dictates, we must first conform to the current political understandings that race and culture and 
this whole intersectionality crap so, dictates so how we share the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I must say, and I, this I, is heresy. So I, I can tell you with a straight face that Justin Welby is a false teacher. Kevin, what must teaching you say? words contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, we go back to you know, thank God, a couple of first century Roman soldiers, the occupying force, the colonial force of the first century, didn't hear Justin Welby say, ooh, you need to really take in your guilt before you can tell your families and friends in the world about Jesus. You know? So that, that's, let's use some theological shorthand for a moment and say, what is Satan's trick mm -hmm. that the, the hobbles the church? And the answer is, um, that that we are engaging in a secular society which is using victimization secular marxism as its as its major trope its major narrative now what that means is because of it's using history against us because history has been christian uh, and white and colonialist it means that it's uh, making it difficult for us to make a distinction between that and the gospel but the the fact is um the, the Jesus is is the ultimate victim. If you're going to talk about victim culture, then Jesus is much more a victim, for example, than Muhammad. So when when, for example, the Archbishop of York says, "Well, we we are at one with grief with our Muslim friends," as indeed we are. The the, the as we talk about Christchurch, which is so immensely difficult, um, there are things we can say. Uh, terrorism is not the right word. This man was a murderer. Um, there is no right wing conspiracy, but there's a but there's a great deal of anger in history about the damage that mutually antipathetic cultures have done to each other. But if we go to the the, the real problem that the Archbishop presented to the Christian constituency was to talk about Muslims as being our Abrahamic cousins. Now, there's there's no doubt at all that 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 Arabs and all other Muslims. Uh, are our brothers and sisters in that they are made in the image of God, but they're not our Abrahamic cousins. Why not? Because to call them that endorses Muhammad's Quranic narrative. That was exactly what he was claiming, and it isn't true. Why isn't it true? Because the Abraham he wrote about in Quran, he invented. It's got nothing to do with the Abraham in the Pentateuch. The Moses he writes about is invented. Mary is invented. Jesus is invented. They are all distortions. And he claimed this cousinship in order to show that his revelation was greater. But the moment you accept that, you cannot accept his statement that we have this Abrahamic relationship filtered by his theological pronouncements as they are and not accept that Jesus was a fraud and didn't rise from the dead. Now, the trouble is most people don't know very much about Muhammad or or Islam. But one of the things we ought to be able to do in our culture, as we refuse all vengeance, as we insist no Muslims must be harmed, but we have the right to criticize Islam, is to, to, to compare Moses and Jesus. Jesus was the victim, Moses was the aggressor. Uh, Muhammad, I'm sorry, not Moses. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Muhammad, Jesus and Muhammad. One of the, I have uh, been reading a book, uh, the autobiography of Whitaker Chambers called Witness, and I'm just struck by so many of the parallels between Chambers' journey through the Soviet world, communist world, and our modern world. And he has a passage that he quotes from Karl Marx, saying that a sign of the last stage in Marxist worldview of a civilization is that when a section of the middle class intelligentsia defects to the other side and seeks to destroy from within its culture. And what we're seeing and that's what he was writing about of uh, liberal fellow travelers who were Soviet spies. And we're seeing not an exact parallel, but we're seeing uh, people within the church circles aping and parroting things that are contrary to the gospel and pushing, pushing forward truths that may be uh, believed by the secular humanist world, but are utterly rejected by a Christian. And they do it. I don't know whether ignorance or out of malice. I don't know what it is, but well, it's just appalling. I think they do it because they, getting back to Pelagianism, they don't understand evil. Mm. They, there's just no conceptual understanding of evil uh, anymore. They don't understand God. And so when these things happen in New Zealand, what's the first thing to do? Let's take away the guns. 
let's take away the tools of evil and that will stop evil let's take away anything that they could use um, against another person and that will stop evil once and for all we have the solution George and Gavin they don't have a solution for evil they don't understand evil well, there's, there's a great close link between George's congregation, uh, the Archbishop, uh, and the press. The press constantly pursue this trope. We are, of course, invited to develop the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what one of the things we're trying to do on this show. We're trying to look at the world of the church, look at the, sorry, look at the world and the church through, through the, the, the best gaze that we can. But, but part of the problem is we're dealing with a, a suffocation of cultural distortion. So not many people will know that last Monday, uh, 140 Christians were butchered by Muslims in northern Nigeria. The press doesn't pick it up. Why? Um, well, that, actually, that, that's a really hard question. One of the things I'm having trouble figuring out is why it is that the press have bought into Islam as the victim uh, trope narrative in the last 20 years as they have. So in other words, if, if, if there's an atrocity against Christians, the press is blind to it. If there's an atrocity against Muslims, God forbid it has happened, then the press uses it. In fact, in, in England for the last three days, you can't turn on, I only watch the news online because I won't pay a license fee to the BBC. But, but the news I see online has been truly appalling in two senses. One is it's been showing us the faces of of bereaved Muslim parents and children, and it's awful, and I can only take so much of it. But the other is I say, well, where, what happened to the Nigerian Christians? Are, are they no more or less bereaved? Why this censorship of narrative? In the, why has Islam become the victim culture and Christianity the bad dominant one, when actually the historical truth is exactly the opposite? Jesus is the victim and Muhammad is the oppressor. How is it that somehow our culture has managed to allow this central historical fact to be distorted and then play into this, this, this reinterpretation of, of political and cultural narrative? Well, I can, yeah. I, I'll, I'll say something. Black lives don't matter. Um, that's the lesson that we're taught in the American press all the time. Um, when when uh, Arab Sudanese Christians were murdering African, uh, when Arab uh, Muslims Sudanese from uh, were murdering black Muslim hmm. Sudanese in Darfur, didn't matter. No, yeah, nothing. It, do, it does, no, doesn't matter. Uh, the the way the world's reporting is set up is that unless it can somehow be reflected black back uh, against the, the Western culture, it doesn't matter. So for instance, while during the whole apartheid era when the white uh, minority government would do all these nasty things to its uh, African indigenous population, we'd hear about it all the time. Drive across the border uh, to uh, black African nations where the mm. situation was much worse you couldn't you didn't hear word one mm -hmm. about the massacres and persecutions and uh, so on and so forth because black lives don't matter um, I, I know that's extreme and extraordinary but i can only say after having been in, in and around the news business for 30 years it was one, of the, one of the jokes I, one of the jokes uh, one of the jokes i had when i started writing for the living church was i came to the editor and i said i got a great breaking news story out of canada and he turned to me with a straight face and said, there are no news stories out there. <laughs> <laughs> but there's well, a, a, a reality. Well, I want to, you know, just look in the last three weeks. Anti-Semitism is pretty much an official thing happening in the Congress here in the United States of America. And they can't find themselves to condemn it. They, not, they can condemn all hate. But they can no longer specifically condemn on paper, signed and voted for, anti-semitism and That's this is I'm, a I'm, complete change we've had in in just this year it's one of the reasons why i think kevin we have to go back to your reminder that we're dealing with evil uh, one of the things that's happened to me over the last 30 years is my, my experience of evil has broken down my willingness to hide in in, in within psychological categorizations one of the reasons i enjoyed uh but 
moving into the whole sphere of, of Jungian, particularly psychology, uh, over the last 30 years is because it, it saved me from the pain of, of having to face up to the reality of the demonic uh, and of raw evil. As it so happens in the last 10 years, my experiences have been so raw and so clear that I was no longer able to hide in that. But I think one of the reasons why people are willing to do it is that there is no, going back to George's Pelagianism, there is no greater sense of helplessness than being faced by, 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 by demons and by Satan and by their influence. Because at that point, you have to really adopt high-octane, repentant Christianity and nothing else will work. So, of course, it's much easier to, to, to not to do that and then to engage in some kind of alternative worldview. But, but anti-Semitism for me is, is the prime fingerprint of Satan. He so hates God's chosen people uh, and then the church, their successors, that wherever you see it coming into the public sphere, I say to myself, my goodness me, for whatever reasons, Satan is unbound and, and this, these are his footprints and his fingerprints. One of the, one of the I think, the, one of the great Christians of our generation is a man named Andrew White. I've known him uh, uh, maybe 25 odd years. And White was the vicar of Baghdad, and nobody can say that White is prejudiced against the Arab world or the yeah. Muslim world. He's given his life to work with them, and he's given a life to building bridges between Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. White's comment after the, and White is in very poor health, he's not active anymore. One of his comment after this massacre, his first comment was, of course, sadness and prayers for those who, the souls of those who had died. But he said, you know, there's going to be a hit back. And, yeah. and it's not going to happen in New Zealand, but it's going to happen in Sudan, in Pakistan, in Muslim majority countries. This incident will be pointed to as, uh, we, and given religious sanction by official mm -hmm. religious leaders, not nuts and kooks, but official religious leaders to say, now you have permission to extract revenge mm -hmm. on our Christian minority because of the action of a murderer against Muslims in another country. Let me take that one step further. I think Islam is now going to be kind of the endorsed default religion mm -hmm. of places like America and Britain uh, and other Western countries because they are the religion of peace, as we've been hearing over and over and over again. Now they're the victims of Christian crusaders in a very visual way, live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. Um, you know, just watch the next school shooting. That will also be live streamed uh, thanks to this. Um, we've, we've now seen a default of what society thinks is the religion they should endorse because they have really been victims and the culture's like, oh, we've Look, learned I, now I, for well, 30, we've learned now for 30 years that Christianity are oppressors, impressor, uh, oppressors. There's colonialism was oppressors, and that you know, in reality, maybe Islam is the religion of peace. Well, look how quickly. Just watch. Do you remember the Pittsburgh ma synagogue massacre? Mm -hmm. We we where a a, a nut a, a a coop went in and murdered all these people in a synagogue, and within the year you have open, virulent anti-Semites in Congress attacking uh, Jews for having double loyalties to the United States. This is the same sort of stuff that Hitler would say, of the Jews being money grubbers, of all the... In other words, the response to the murder of Jews uh, was, but has been anti-Semitism. Uh, will, we, will we see... Uh, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment arise out of the murder of Muslims? No, we won't. We'll see anti-Christian and anti-Semitic sentiments arise out of the murder of Muslims. There's something strange going on. Well, it really is. It's, it's entirely irrational. And the, the secular population appears to, in a schizophrenic way, hold two notions which are entirely opposed to each other. One is it, it, it sanctifies victimhood, partly because of the cultural Marxist uh, narrative we talked about but it really gets off on force 
It, it quite likes force wherever it sees it. And of course, Islam in an extraordinary way embodies both victimhood, according to the cultural Marxist narrative, and it engages in, in force in a terrifying way. Christianity can stand up to this if it is authentic, but what it can't do is compete with this, this, this uh, composite uh, contradiction if it simply apes or watered down view of secularism. And my great complaint against the leaders of Anglicanism, certainly in this country uh, and uh, amongst Episcopalians, is that all they have done is they've, they've tried to make Christianity accessible and acceptable to people by denuding it of the things that really matter uh, and adopting a certain kind of secular uh, virtue signaling. So it's going to be hard enough to stand up to Islam as, as believing Christians. Again, the only way of doing it is, is not by being horrible to Muslims. God forbid, we have to love them. But always, I think, comparing Jesus to Muhammad, that, that's the, the, the clear way through this is to say to people, if you're going to make a choice, make a choice on the basis of choosing between Jesus and Muhammad. Anything else will get lost in the fog of neurosis. Would well, Justin Welby be upset if Islam was the default religion of Britain? Would the, the Archbishop of York, I mean, would any of the leaders in the Church of England uh, be upset? I, I can't say they would. Well, actually, I will defend one, the Bishop of Birmingham, okay. uh, where the Muslims protested the introduction of the gay curriculum, gay-friendly curriculum in a primary school. And the Muslim, and it was a predominantly Muslim area, and the uh, parents revolted, 80% of them withheld their children from the school. And the Muslim community went to Bishop Urquhart of Birmingham asking for their moral support because, of course, Christianity teaches the same sort of general thing on uh, homosexuality, except as Islam does, except we do not call for Muslims to be thrown off of high towers, uh, Muslim Muslims. gays to be th <laughs> homosexuals to be thrown off of high towers to be murdered for their homosexuality. And the Church of England responded, no, we're going to back the gay lobby in this fight. So here is somebody standing up to Islam, but they're not standing up for Christian principles. They're standing up for uh, secular humanist principles. There's a very this is good the Church of England. There's a very good article written by Jules Gomez. J Jules produces some very high quality stuff regularly, and he he talks about the way the the, the British in colonial India required Muslims to 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 chew on pig fat in order to bite their their bullets, which were encased in pig fat, and how. Uh, how appalling this was, and it led to a big Muslim kickback. Now, he says, that the, uh, uh, the Anglicans have repented somewhat of forcing Muslims to chew pig fat by being much more sympathetic about, for example, halal meat. Uh, again, the, the, the promotion of halal meat, which is taking place throughout English society uh, and involves a good deal of animal suffering, is an, is an odd thing to do. But the Church of England has come out very strongly in favour of halal principles. So you might think that in this Islamification, it would, if it was going to be consistent, uh, then also be sympathetic towards these Muslim parents who want to avoid LGBT indoctrinization and sexualization of children. But at this point, it refuses. And in a way that is completely inconsistent with any other theory, except that it is morally corrupt and spiritually bankrupt it then does a 90 degree turn and backs the lgbt lobby effectively it zigzags between lgbt culture and islamic demands uh, wherever the pressure is placed upon it it seems incapable of being authentically christian it has no confidence in its own christian heritage and culture and beliefs indeed one of the things uh, while we were waiting for gavin to join us kevin and i were nattering on at what point is Justin Welby irrelevant? At what point is the Church of England hierarchy, institution, I'm not talking about the people, irrelevant to the conversation? In other words, Justin Welby gives these uh, god-awful uh, statements about colonialism and the Archbishop of York had these rather silly, ignorant statements about Islam. At what point do I basically say, oh, I've turned them off? Now, it seems that 90% of the people of England have turned off the Church of England and yeah. paid no mind to it. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden become Muslims. They're just there. Um, 
and sort of a lapping up the secular humanist worldview. I think well, they have, well Kevin. quickly, I think they have become the public library. I think they have just become this institution where you go for the baptisms and you go for the weddings and uh, it, it's a cultural thing. It's no longer a kingdom thing in England. There's been a very interesting podcast on uh, The Spectators, one of our better political magazines. Uh, and uh, it's run, The Spectators' religious section is run by a, a, a gay Roman Catholic journalist who's quite astute called Damien Thompson. Uh, and in the last episode, they they read out from the Bishop of London, uh, Sarah, I must get her name right, because I, uh, Mullally, that's it. I, I'm afraid, God, God forgive me, I keep on wanting to call her Sarah Doolally. But, but the reason that I have that in my mind is they read out Sarah Mullally's recent statements uh, saying that the, the Church of England bishops, and to some extent they were also saying this is true of Catholic bishops, are incapable of saying anything without the jargonese of corporate speak or or, or or secular speak. And indeed, if you listen to them, you wonder how any person at the top of an organization could be quite so, so dim. Uh, and they were saying that the, the bishops of both the, uh, the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church are so third rate that, that nobody does listen to them anymore. The problem is when, when, when the ordinary people look at authentic Christianity, and I keep on wanting to go back to street preachers, because they, with their courage, remind us of the, uh, of the mandate that we're given in the Gospels to preach the Gospel in and out of season, even if they do it in a rather clumsy, clumsy way. But there, the populace turns on them. Uh, and in this last particular episode, we had a, uh, where we talked about it, a preacher who stood outside Southgate Station. He was complained about by a Muslim who was offended because by calling Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, he was offending Muhammad. So he called a policeman and invited to embrace Sharia law. And Sharia law is to shut up anybody who offends Muhammad explicitly or implicitly, and the police did. And the population of England say, this is great by us. So it, whether or not they make an active choice, my sense has always been that we're going to have to choose between Jesus and Muhammad. And if you do not choose Jesus, you will get Muhammad. And that's a tragedy. Mm. Gentlemen, we um, need to... Uh, I, oh, what, are we going to finish up or you got some good stuff going on? No, I was just saying that uh, Justin Welby really needs to go. But yes. if he does, will it make any difference? Is no, he, somebody worse will come. You no, know, is, is, is the... <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we did have this we, we, we shall have Sarah, Sarah. We shall have Sarah, Sarah Mullally or the next Archbishop of York who will be one of two uh, profoundly committed feminist women. Awfully nice people, nice to have coffee with, but utterly feminist, uh, holding Erastian and Aryan doctrines of, of, of the church and the world. Well, uh, the Scottish Episcopal Church didn't bite the bullet this weekend. Kelp Holdsworth, the provost of Glasgow, <laughs> he was the one guy. He is the 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 uh, the one who hosted the uh, uh, shahadi that called Islam in his cathedral, and uh, is just, was the one who said that he hoped that is it Prince William, uh, yeah. the little child, uh, grows up gay, and yeah. he was the considered the favorite in the secular press to be the next bishop of Glasgow, and the electors refused to go along. So far, George, just so far, it could still happen. I've been saying to the Lord, Lord, don't do this to me, please. Not, not a thorn in the flesh like this, but, you know, it could still happen. Well, that is true, because technically now that the, El the Electoral Synod refused to elect him, the bishops, as a committee, can appoint him if they so choose. Yeah. Indeed, they could. Which uh, would be a rather extraordinary thing. Well, and if, they didn't, if they didn't, George, it would just show the level and depth of their homophobia. That's well, right. actually, they didn't do this for Jeffrey John, so I don't know if they'll uh, do it. What new generation of nut jobs? But, uh. <laughs> All right, let, let's close out the program. As I said in the beginning, we need your prayers. You need to intercede for Anglican Unscripted. Uh, your hosts here have put up with an extraordinary month of cruelty and evil beyond measure. Uh, and uh, it's it's time to move on. Pray for our healing and all this. Uh, and we will have another show at the end of the week, I hope. 
Let yeah. me add, add, Kevin is not speaking using hyperbole. We use hyperbole all the time, but in his mm. description of our lives in the last month, he's not been using hyperbole. It really has been that bad. Uh, yes. I'm Kevin Carlson. <clears throat> I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. He who endures to the end shall be saved. You've been listening, if it ever gets out, to episode 495 of Anglican Unscripted. 